We're here to tell a tale from the recent past to reveal our hidden processes and discuss our epic task. It was the sunset of Jane Leno and the sunrise of Jimmy Fallon. We needed a lot of droopy sauce. We drank it by the gallon. We had no JS and a D8 facing architecture and a semantic content model. A multinational distributed software team and a workflow that did not throttle. It was the sunset of Jay Leno and the sun was Jimmy Fallon. We used a lot of Drupal sauce to drink it by the gallon. So stay a while and listen. And I think you will agree that for five o'clock on a Tuesday at DrupalCon Austin 2014, there's no better place to be. Well, thank you everyone for being such a wonderful audience at our uh, musical session today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Andrew Berry, and uh, I'm an architect at Lullabot, and up here with me on stage is musical genius extraordinaire David Dyers. Dears. Dears. <laughs> These people. I know. <laughs> Only took months, and I still can't get it right. Um, and today, we're going to be talking about The Tonight Show. No. <laughs> Luckily for us, we still have a keyboard. There you go. So, The Tonight Show is the longest running television show in history. And I mean that, like, not just in North America, not just in the English speaking world, but in all of the television that's ever been produced. And that's 11,000 episodes of episodic content that's been produced since 1954. And this is the Tonight Show website. It's a responsive, touch-friendly, uh, very dynamic website. And when it comes down to it, it's an app. It's more than just a way for, for documents to be presented on the web. Now, for those of us who have been around the building websites for 10 or more years, we've really seen the internet take off as this tool for us to share our experiences with one another and with people who are really uh, far away and disparate from ourselves. And this was really important in the design of the Tonight Show website because the primary use case for the app is to make these shareable experiences and these shareable moments from the show be able to be watched and viewed and then shared out to people you care about as easily and as quickly as possible. And as we were designing our architecture for the site, whether it was technical or project or some other part of the site, that's what we always came back to to keep us grounded in reality, reality these concepts of shareable moments. So yeah, here's Drupal, but, but step back, not really. Drupal is just one component of several different systems that have all been built and tuned to work together to produce what you see in your browser today. So today, David and I, we're going to talk about how we went all the way from a Drupal installation screen to what you can pull up. Now, NBC Universal is itself the amalgamation of two very large companies. And in fact, a couple of years back, NBC Universal was bought out by Comcast, and together they have something like 136,000 employees. At least that's what Wikipedia told me. So as soon as you start thinking about organizations that large and that big and with that many competing ideas and interests, you're probably thinking enterprise software. And at least to me, those words would probably make me think of words like large and complicated and slow, and 18 months to anything, even for a project that's already been going for 18 months. But 
let's take a look at what needs to happen to build a website to relaunch or create a new entertainment talk show today. First of all, they have to choose a host because the host is the cornerstone of figuring out what the creative direction and the content of the show is going to be. So then they have to, once they've chosen a host, figure out who the staff is going to be and start that hiring process, and that can take quite a lot of time. And then they have to define the, the creative direction in concert with the host and actually start defining the, the segments of the show and the bits of the show. And ideally, all of this needs to happen before any technical work begins. Because otherwise, you're not going to be building a website that's actually useful because it's not going to model what they're trying to create. So even then, if we get all of that in place, it just gets us a website that would mirror the show, a website that isn't necessarily a first-class experience. And to be effective and competitive in today's really crazy media entertainment marketplace, the web needs to be a first-class component of the show experience. It's got to be a channel for both unique and repeat content. So in the case of The Tonight Show, uh, all of those prerequisites for the uh, content and the direction of the show, by the middle of December 2013, we had reached a point where we could actually start to build things and uh, start to think about building the website and the apps. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the show or watched the Olympics when they were heavily advertising it, The Tonight Show launched on February 17th, 2014. You throw in some holidays in the middle there, and that doesn't give you a lot of time to get a website out. It certainly isn't 18 months. And when it came down to it, we had about six weeks. So how were we going to pull this off? Well, before I get into that, I'd like to talk about who was involved, because how the, the project was actually composed of the team members was really important in determining the technical architecture that we went with. So... First of all, primary, our, our, our main guest for this evening would be NBC Entertainment Digital, and they're responsible for anything and everything that has to do with the NBC television entertainment brand. Uh, and so they're building all sorts of tools for all their different television shows. And then there's also uh, NBC ONTS, or Operations and Technical Support, and there's some of them here watching right now, which is just great. And they're the team behind the Publisher 7 distribution uh, at NBC, which is what they do all of their sort of customizations to integrate with NBC systems and other things. Um, but then there was also Crispin Porter, who was actually the primary contractor for the Tonight Show build-out. And anything that you see which was publicly visible, that was work that they did. So whether it's the website or the apps, they were in charge of looking... At, over their, their design and care. So then finally we get down to Four Kitchens and Lullabot, and we really helped round out the Drupal team. Um, we'd worked together on NBC.com, which at the time was in parallel but not yet launch development, and so we sort of provided expertise and consulting and so on. And when it came down to it, the sun never set on the Tonight Show team. Not only did we have a complex site to build with a tight timeline, but we were all over the place. And uh, we had a, to, to really figure out how to manage that. If you look at this, like, we're basically covering the whole world uh, as far as you know, east to west. And I remember realizing in the middle of December, this is what we've got to build the site. How are we going to do this? If this project is going to launch on time and have a full set of features, We'll need to structure the project and the architecture of the technology to be non-blocking and dependency-free. So what's our first step in order to figure out how we're actually going to make this happen? Like anything else, we needed to decompose the system. We needed to define what all of the systems were that needed to be built, figure out what their roles and responsibilities were, and then figure out who was the primary expert in each of those systems. So we did a bunch of brainstorming, and uh, we came up with all of these topics, from content modeling to uh, video, which in itself is like a very complex item, so it needs to be separated out from your content, through to the Drupal side of things, through to the people who needed to actually understand what the show was going to be doing, um, and then the very technical components of the APIs we would need to implement for the mobile apps and the systems that would actually drive everything. And we knew that we really wanted to have, uh, 
for lack of a better word, an entertaining front end, which was going to need a lot of effort, and then of course the mobile apps themselves. So we started through from the source of the content to us as technical architects, and we moved through each way, or through the entire system to figure out how that content would eventually get to the end user. So our first uh, item ended up being content modeling. This was really, really important. And what I think was interesting about it uh, was that everyone needed to work on it. It needed to be something that everyone had a solid understanding and a solid vocabulary around so that we could communicate with everyone, whether you were a front-end designer or a show producer. And it was about the only item that everyone needed to have total responsibility in to be successful. Uh, the API design was handled by David and myself, as well as someone from Crispin Porter. And this was where we started to be able to decouple the project structure, because we could make it so that the API, for all intents and purposes, was really a responsibility of the tech teams to make sure it was being built right and well. And NBC, as an organization, cared in the sense that they were going to have to maintain the API and actually live with whatever decisions we made. But when it came down to it, it was more of sort of an oversight and review and long-term thinking versus managing the day-to-day -day decisions of the API itself. Uh, and then we had the actual Drupal or Publisher 7 implementation, uh, which uh, David and myself worked on, as well as some other people from uh, both of our companies and uh, a developer from Crispin Porter. Uh, and then video, of course, video is always a special case, and so we had someone dedicated to just video who got to run down that rabbit hole for a few weeks. And then front end and apps, totally Crispin Porter. I have no idea about how they actually work you know, deep in the code. They just are there. Uh, and then that left NBC free to become our show and infrastructure experts without having to worry about all of these other components that needed to happen. Uh, as we were working through these slides, uh, David had this great analogy that I just can't do justice, so I'm going to let him give it. So, in a way, this whole process was exactly like winning at Lip Sync Battle, which is a segment on the Jimmy Fallon Tonight Show. And the rules of Lip Sync Battle are as follows. Uh, two contestants enter. Uh, and uh, they both take turns singing popular songs that they have pre-selected. The opposing team, the opponent, does not know the song that the other person selected. And uh, the goal is to one-up each other, uh, culminating in a final performance. Uh, and at the end, Jimmy Fallon always concedes to the other player. So in that way, this is exactly, absolutely nothing at all like lip sync battle in any way whatsoever. Uh, but it is a, it's actually a little bit like playing lip sync battle because you, well, you don't know your opponent's song, so we had low visibility to the intent of other teams, um, which meant we could allow independent iteration on other layers of the site, see how that works. Um, we, you can only control how well uh, we did on a particular team. So you play to your strengths, and you have to really have to go for it. And then it's also this lightly competitive structure, conducive to enabling the other teams to, to do their best. Basically, everybody's working really hard and doing their very finest work, uh, which that competitive structure just dissolves at the end, and everybody wins. Except for Jimmy, who concedes. <laughs> I'm glad no one had to concede on this project. Um, so where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us with our non-blocking approach, which basically ended up being a decoupled app and web front end with a services-based Drupal API powering the whole thing. And an abstracted content model uh, that allowed us to both model the show and the elements of The Tonight Show and continuously iterate on it without breaking things as we went through basically week by week doing iteration on this six-week project. So this is a standard Drupal site. Content goes in, whether it's from a service like MPX or editors at a keyboard, and in the end, views come out or panels comes out or bean or whatever it is that you're using today to make stuff come out. And we're all pretty familiar with this. This is how we've been building Drupal sites for a while now. And it's not that different from Drupal 5 or Drupal 6 build outs that we may have done. Uh, and in this case, we uh, have a lot of anonymous 
traffic hitting the site, so we've got varnish and caching in front of it just to make sure that uh, you know, the site works. So we throw Akamai in front of that because we really care about making sure that nothing happens and uh, you know, that helps with geolocation and so on. Uh, yeah, you know, it's like anything else in computer science, just add another layer of caching and make it better. And what's really interesting about how this played out is this still looks like a standard Drupal setup or a standard PHP setup for that matter. But this is where everything changes because everything we know and hold dear is how you build a site that's all it is, an API. To the consumers of the API, they don't care about how it's hosted, how it's built, who's running it or why. They just know that there is documentation that says that they can get the, the, the data they need somewhere living in the cloud. And I feel like this level of abstraction is something which is really powerful for what we can do with our, our projects because it basically enables us to work with the whole web community instead of just Drupal developers as far as site building goes. So, you know, if we're thinking about how content actually gets out to an end user, yeah, we've got this API, um, and then there's this node and varnish and Akamai in front of that because, yeah, more caching. Um, and then we have a backbone app, which is actually what you get when you run the browser. You've got the first page which comes out of Node, so it's all fast and snappy, but then all of your, ex your, your future interactions with the site are entirely controlled by Backbone. And something else which uh, came out of this which really helped validate our API design is that right now we've got one API client, but pretty quickly we had two. We had the Node app and we had the Backbone app. And uh, as soon as you start having multiple clients interacting with the same data set, it allows you to verify that your data works the way it's supposed to and that your API is actually usable. So you're just an end user and you're like, wow, this is a lot of stuff to go through just to get my Tonight Show videos. It is, but at least it's something entertaining at the end. So we've built this sort of API decoupled system that, you know, from a, a very high level architecture standpoint, allowed us to encapsulate and abstract the Drupalisms of the site. Um, but that was just one small part of what made this project work within our tight timeline. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to David to talk about the next entertaining part. Thank you, Andrew. So yes, um, Andrew mentioned before, and there were really there's two components of the site. One was the decoupled uh, Cope solution, and the other was the semantic content model. And so I'm going to explain what I mean by semantic content model in a moment, but I'd like to start with kind of how we got there. So in a tight deadline situation like this, um, we felt the best thing that, that we could do uh, as, as consultants, as uh, architects, was to unblock the most amount of people to allow all the teams to move forward at once. And the biggest contender for that work was the API. If we developed a good API where uh, we had a shared understanding of what would be coming out of the API, basically define the endpoints um, and the outputs of the system. And then from there, we could actually work towards uh, making that happen in code on the back end and to ingest that code on the front ends. Uh, but we didn't necessarily have to do that work up front. We could just define what was going to come out. And so we started down that path but we found that it was um, quickly very prescriptive and unsustainable. And you see, it's a bit like Jeopardy, where you are creating the answers to questions that you're going to provide the questions to later. Um, and we found that with the content, with the basic content model that we created, that we, the questions that we could ask to get those answers were very limited. So they were, they were tied to displays specifically. So the endpoints tended to produce things that were for specific displays on the app, say the Android app or the iOS app. And they were very formulated to those things specifically, or the website. And that's just not great RESTful design. It's a very display-centric API with a few concessions for REST. And that led us to this. So it's pretty close to a blocking workflow and clearly not going to help us succeed because 
With our front ends and back ends tightly coupled like that, it reduced our overall reusability of those endpoints. It, it was a content model that didn't have the long-term flexibility for the editorial team. So the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, if you've seen before the show launched uh, on the Jimmy Fallon Show, it was a very innovative show, and he was constantly working out new bits and uh, new segments. That uh, and he just was flowing with the times, and that's how good late night TV works. It's very topical. So. Um, Tying things into very specific um, pieces of fields or content just wasn't going to work for editorial at all. So this type of coupled content model where the elements are composed of things that drive specific displays, um, well, when change comes along, either at the business level, at the show level, or at the display level, um, it's going to require a lot of work on the uh, consuming technologies, the node and backbone technologies, but also the back end as well. So that wasn't something that was going to allow us to work asynchronously and all move forward at once. It was going to require a lot of back and forth, and I'm, I can't actually move forward because the endpoint doesn't work for me any longer. And uh, so the, that kind of blocking workflow was just not going to help us meet that deadline. Very aggressive. So based on that approach, while we wanted to get the endpoints defined and the outpoints defined to have everybody move forward, we realized we needed to take a step back and rework that content uh, model. And that was really, for us, the dawn of the semantic content model. So in, Drup in, in a typical Drupal site, it can be very easy to have a page-centric content model. And like the display-centric content model, you, you might start with the answer. So I have a page here, an About Us page, and I have a listing page. And from those pages, you devise the fields and relationships between those fields and relationships between those pieces of content to create your Drupal content model. It's a page-centric content model. But it has a lot of the same problems. You have uh, something very dangerous driving your, your content. <laughs> So the, in a, the, as with the display-centric content model, you have a very tightly coupled solution in a page-centric content model. And neither of these solutions are flexible or sustainable in the way that you want or need for a website that needs to live past its launch. So the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon doesn't exist because it has a website. It has a website because it has a show. It has a property. So why let the website drive the modeling of the business? Ultimately, it's going to be more meaningful for the editorial staff and for NBC Digital to have the show drive the site and the content model. So that's where, how we ended up at semantic content modeling, which is going to have us create structures inside the content model that resemble the real life elements of the business. For the Jimmy Fallon Tonight Show, that means it's going to resemble the segments and the pieces of the Tonight Show that we all know and love. And so since Drupal wasn't responsible for driving a page, pages at all, it's, it's not responsible for being a website, and because we had this sensitivity, because we started to form those endpoint answers and suspected what kinds of questions could we ask to get those answers, we had, a, we had renewed sensitivity to this display-centric modeling. And because we were both removed from page-centric and had a sensitivity to, to display-centric modeling, we really set about creating these agnostic and dependency-free semantic content endpoints. One last point about all this, though. With semantic uh, content points, it's really important that you have the right level of resolution. Uh, for us, that meant that um, we were basically having a 10,000-foot or, or a 10, view rather than a 100-foot view because that volatility of content that Jimmy Fallon uh, segments tend to have, and he's constantly iterating on his show and trying to improve it and, and, and make new funny bits and be topical. Um, modeling it too closely to specific segments like Lip Sync Battle, which is something that wasn't going to be working for us in the long run. So with that, uh, Eddie Lee from NBC had the fantastic idea that you know we could build off the smallest element of the Tonight Show, and it's a late night te te television show, and the smallest element of a late night television show, the smallest atomic unit of funny, is the joke. That's the big reveal. How about that? So, uh, <laughs> which coincides actually perfectly with the mission of the site, which are those shareable moments of. Uh, was just creating those shareable moments, those spaces of like, did you see that thing that happened on The Tonight Show last night? That's, that's, that's a conversation that you have at the water cooler the next morning. And so and in creating that, it was like, that's based around jokes. That's based around specific punchlines. That's based around uh, the formation of multiple punchlines. And so really thinking semantically, we have jokes, and many jokes form up a, a bit, 
and uh, many bits form up a segment, which is from commercial to commercial, uh, and many segments form up an episode. Uh, episodes contain uh, appearances from guests, be they musical, political, comedians, actors, actresses, so on and so forth. As a website property, uh, we also have these other supporting elements, however. We have um, the social media challenge. So Jimmy, every Wednesday night, uh, has a Twitter challenge uh, where he has people uh, tweet in to a specific hashtag and, and reads them over the air. He also has an Instagram challenge and so forth. And then we also have the games, which are uh, multimedia experiences that people can have on their iOS or Android devices or the website. So in practice, taking this idea that we were going to break things down semantically, we ended up with a semantic content model, mostly. So what we found, you know, as with anything, uh, Absolution is going to perhaps come to unwieldiness. So uh, it's, it's a lot like database optimization, which is my love. Um, but, uh, you know, too much of it makes things a little bit unwieldy. So we found a multi-layered approach to our content model actually served us a little bit better and was a little bit easier to work with within the constraints of our, our time limit. So. In practice, we ended up creating entities that weren't semantic, but were building blocks. And these are things like videos, images, carousel items, so on and so forth. Those items got built into the semantic objects. So the semantic objects use these building blocks. Semantic objects were, as previously mentioned, bits, segments, challenges, games, guests. And then, the, you know, our concession. So originally we had a model that was a display-centric API with a few concessions for REST. What we ended up with was a RESTful API with a few concessions for display. And in our display-centric concessions, uh, and, and we first saw a little bit, but it just made it happen. You know, and, and sometimes you have to make those concessions, and in, in an absolute world, you, you wouldn't have to, but uh, you also have a deadline, and you know, it's, part of it is meeting that. So, uh, so we had carousels, blog posts, queues of semantic items, image galleries that contain building blocks and semantic items. So, And all that to the benefit of that it gave all of the teams, uh, from the developing teams to the QA teams, and, and that's the multiple multinational development teams. Uh, so the apps teams for Android, for iOS, for the website, for the back end, uh, the QA teams, which were in California and India, um, the editorial teams at NBC. We all had a shared, meaningful language that was native not only to the website, but to the show, to the property itself. And that helped us all talk about things and envision where things were going and, and really have a common language. It also made sense editorially for the long term because this is Drupal as a product. The Publisher 7 distribution is a, is a common editorial uh, workflow set of tools that lead to a workflow process for NBC that they are used to supporting and used to engaging with editorially. So now we finally placed our content in the driver's seat and uh, it's driving the property, or so the property is driving the content model, not the website driving the content model. And this leads me to sort of the other element of our, of our approach, which was that uh, the other part of our non-blocking approach, which was our API. So I'll talk briefly about that. So once we had this content model in place, we were able to establish our outs um, finally and define these uh, elements that were going to allow our multi-platform, multi-team development style to happen independently of each other. We could sh have a shared agreement about what these things were going to look like and develop against those, both building the, the Drupal system that was going to spit these things out and building the consuming technologies that were going to take that data and make it into a beautiful website or app experience. This allowed us to develop with, uh, with reasonable agility and respond to the volatility both from iterations on the front end from editorial's experience with the site and Jimmy Fallon for that matter, um, but also with our own uh, experiences with uh, bugs and things like that. So it also freed up the front end to really have frequent updates. It also, interestingly enough, once we uh, had agreed on what these things needed to be, we could create the content and content teams could be entering in that content right away. There wasn't any delay, there wasn't any last minute rush when you know, one day before the site launched, you know, we had something in dev or staging that, or production that just wasn't public and everyone rushed to get in content and it was a mad dash and it's four in the morning and bugs are cropping up. That, that never happened because content teams could be working on the content the second that we had iterated something out. So our product, while it was you know, actually the API, it was a little bit more than that. Um, 
it's more than meets the API. <laughs> so at first glance, <laughs> you know, we're, we're talking about, um, well, we have these outs, and they're defined, and that's great. Uh, but we also have our, our, our sort of an agreement about how these points are going to work in the future and what the internal structures of the resources that we have. So what do images look like? How do we respond to those? For responsive websites. What do videos look like? What is, what's the metadata around that? And if we could all come to an agreement about what, what those things are, we didn't necessarily need to know ahead of time that an image was going to be needed for a guest inside of an episode or that a video was going to be needed for um, a gallery because we could predict, because we had set that as an agreement amongst ourselves, what that was going to look like and implementing teams could mock that object up and uh, use the structure as it would be given to them and then simply put in a ticket saying, we need this added to this endpoint. And we could do that and it all just worked. So in many ways, what we're talking about is making the most available member of your team the most available. And that's your system. Your system is actually the most available member of your team. It's not your architects. We go to bed, you know? <laughs> we, we go to the bathroom, we, we, whatever. We have, we have a number of things that we do that, that make us unavailable. Uh, but the system is always there. And if you can create an intelligently designed, uh, highly available member of your team, why not? <laughs> so it could be a person, it could be a spec. In our case, it was the system, and that proved to be very useful for all of us, especially in this asynchronous workflow and a non-blocking workflow. Uh, Andrew has developed a lovely article entitled Legally Binding Your Web APIs, which I recommend uh, that you read. Uh, how are we doing? Okay, maybe we'll just go forward. Uh, <laughs> but it, it basically allowed us to have a versionless, backwards compatible, compatible Hydra-style development model, so um, where we could all move forward. It was iterative and dependency-free. So if decoupled systems need a linchpin, basically something that is highly available that can answer two teams that have questions or need a response or basically don't know how something's going to work, uh, it could be your system. And then that could answer to all those things. And that, and that proved very valuable to us. So the basic concerns of our API were that we needed to provide semantic content, that we needed to provide display content, that it needed to be performant, that it needed to respect permissions and the state of content, whether it's published or not, and, and also that it deliver agnostic and predictable resources, like the images and videos that I spoke of. Uh, what it wasn't concerned with, uh, it wasn't concerned with routing, front-end routing. Of course, it had Drupal menu routing for the endpoints. That's not what I'm talking about. But basically, when you go to the website as a particular page, it wasn't concerned with how it pulled results from the API to make that page. Uh, it wasn't concerned with tailoring those results for a specific device. That was all decided at the app layer. Um, and it wasn't concerned with authenticated audience interaction. So these are some of the things that we dealt with specifically and some of the things that we avoided. Um, we also found, you know, it wasn't an API, it's a poop API. <laughs> so even with, even in a services-based API solution, there are options. So like you could be saying, well, you have six suites, why didn't you just site build this? You know, why didn't you just make a bunch of views, content types, and then spit it out in services? That would have been extremely fast. Like, you're, I can do that by two, you know? 2 p.m., it's done. Okay, let's move on, next project. Slam. But uh, the, the problem is, <laughs> is when you introduce iteration into that model. So for an asynchronously distributed team, that meant um, code was gonna be coming in at night, on the weekends, late at night, early in the morning, at all times, and the architects who needed to review that code and understand what was going on and basically review that for any problems with Drupal um, would be staring at a bunch of features code. You know, um, We had developed, a, for NBC.com, we developed a, an API uh, that was uh, PHP object-oriented uh, based, and it allowed us to really bury a lot of the deep Drupalisms uh, deep into the parent classes and allow the implementing classes to be a lot simpler and a lot cleaner. That meant that we were looking at maybe one line uh, change in an implementing class or an implementing function versus uh, 150 lines of changed features code. And that's going to review a lot cleaner and a lot faster in an asynchronous workflow. So we found that particular process to be really helpful in getting <coughs> things out the door. It also let us leverage um, some existing PHP object-oriented resources that we had who weren't Drupal experts, and they actually didn't need to be because we had implemented all the deep Drupal stuff really down below. Uh, and so they were able to kind of ramp up on that stuff as they needed it. They could pull in specific functions or work with the parent classes or write overriding classes to uh, touch that Drupal stuff 
But for the most part, implementing classes were uh, six lines of code or something like that with a few query specifics. So uh, it turned out to be quite easy for non-Drupal experts to work within a complex Drupal framework, get a services solution out, and uh, be enabling their app consumers or their website consumers. So our, the API in practice, basically we had a few structured calls um, and it looked, we had uh, display centric calls which kind of had some query parameters and then we had some semantic uh, calls which looked a bit more like good restful calls. So those are some of the uh, concessions we made um, and so to a non-semantic, to a display centric, uh, sorry not to a display centric, but to uh, a, a display content type, uh, a call might look like this. So we have episode, episodes ID with 15. The result we get back would be something like this. So you can see here, and you can see the inner details of the image. And so this is like a, a signature that we sort of came upon for images, and then we reuse that every time we had images. And you could have multiple images, and they all kind of look the same. Uh, and, um, and that helped out with the implementing teams, as I mentioned before. Uh, for a semantic resource, you know, here's a call to a semantic resource, and it's going to look very similar. You can see the object image is is uh, repeated here, uh, which is JSON coming out the back end. So, I wouldn't want to leave you with the idea that this is all uh, a rosy picture, though. There are some uh, challenges around Drupal as a content provider. Uh, so, you know, it's not a site. So, the things you're used to getting for free in Drupal uh, might not be there you need to understand what your solutions are for routing. You need to think about the things that Drupal typically gives you. It's going to give you some caching. Do you need additional caching on your front end like we did? Uh, yeah, you probably do is the answer. But um, uh, CDNs are going to become interesting. You know, we have great CDN solutions like the CDN module for Drupal. Uh, but when you're serving that content out that never hits Drupal as a site, you have to kind of figure out, well, what, what's the, what do the addresses need to be? How are we going to figure this out for region and so on and so forth? Um, the, probably the biggest one with, that's going to need a lot of training is your editorial teams are going to experience a disconnect because they don't have a one-to-one -one connection between a form where they enter in uh, content in those fields, save it, and see a web page after that. There's a whole site previewing system that Drupal just has by default that you aren't going to have in a decoupled system. So uh, that is definitely the biggest disconnect, and they need they need to know that the content that they're entering in is going to be used on apps. It's going to look like this, it's going to have this interpretation, it's going to look like this on the website, and they just kind of need an overview of that and, and basically to understand that when they're entering content before any of this stuff is even implemented, that they're going to see something that might look quite different than what actually shows up on the website. Or you need to develop a site proofing situation, so uh, there's another concern. And that leads us uh, to really the more you know section. <laughs> so uh, you know, if we had to do it all again, um, there, there's a couple things we, you know, we kind of <laughs> thought that, you know, yeah. we could do a little bit better. Uh, so uh, really, don't forget that site previewing experience. So, you know, I sort of went on and out because it, it is a bit of a problem. Um, you really need to think through what you're going to do for a decoupled solution and how that's going to be solved. Um, so we definitely would be thinking about that immediately. Uh, you know, as the project was starting, um, probably in my experience. You know, when, if Drupal's not providing a site experience for somebody, you, maybe you can issue soup to nuts stuff. Like, media is great, but actually, I don't need any of the display functionality of media, so maybe I don't use media. Maybe I use a simpler token based solution when I'm embedding media type content into body fields. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think that both of us agree. We just we probably make even less uh, concessions for display. It's not only irksome from an architecture kind of viewpoint, um, but it does make the system overall less sustainable. And um, and I think the objects could be cleaner. So, you know, sticking to your guns on that is going to cost development time, uh, but in the long run, it's going to make a more sustainable solution. Which brings us to the finale. <laughs> we made it. Yeah, so it's kind of crazy, like here, okay, so we've talked about everything we did, but I haven't answered the big question. Did we actually launch the website or not? Did this happen on time? Well, the answer is yes. We got the website to everywhere and anywhere. Um, it launched first week of February, um, and yeah, it just sort of happened. And uh, it's kind of amazing when you think about it, like, 
usually you make that estimate, like, is it possible or not? And in the software world, we get that wrong so often. And, uh, you know, even if it's just wrong by 10%, you know, that's considered really good. And the fact that we had something out and to the public and with real content in it uh, by that first launch was, at least to me, really exciting and kind of amazing. Um, and the, the timeline actually revealed something pretty interesting as well. Yes. Uh, so what, what we saw actually is that um, you know we we had this really aggressive timeline. So we elected to do a decoupled solution that would allow separate teams to act it at their best expertise and basically move forward as quickly as possible uh, together in in, in lockstep. Uh, and that process then gave us a pretty strongly asynchronous workflow, which fed back into uh, being able to iterate faster and doing more uh, decoupled development and improving that model. And so it was this nice uh, synergy between these two areas, uh, allowing us to kind of like, you know, the analogy of like rolling the boulder up the hill and it finally tips over and then it just speeds on through. And it happens more quickly than you even ever imagined. Yeah, and uh, we definitely succeeded at sort of having the system as the architect. Like, I totally was out of the office the week the site launched which is you know, also sort of unheard of in a lot of web projects. Um, and really designing the system as the architect allowed the front end team who was working on different time zones or different hours entirely to actually make assumptions about what we were going to give them before they'd even asked us yet, which uh, is something which you can really use to speed up and make your process work well in parallel. Um, something else which I definitely sort of picked up at the end of the project was when we were figuring out how we were going to build the site in the first place, um, decoupling by that point had certainly been the topic of a lot of Drupal cons, a lot of web conferences, a lot, of, you know, just the web industry was thinking about decoupled content stacks. And it's not like this is a brand new idea. There have been decoupled systems for at least 10 or 15 years now. But... Prior to this project, I'd always, when evaluating uh, a, a new project early on, assumed that it either took one of two things to make it worth decoupling a project. That it either took extraordinary <coughs> content requirements, like a recipe database with millions of recipes. That's going to need a recipe server and a recipe API just so you're not breaking your website under the weight of that. Or you needed to have a really wide number of channels that you were publishing your content out into. Um, and I sort of figured if you had either one of those two scenarios, or both at the same time, then you had to go decoupled. It was the only way to succeed. And when it really sort of, the, the summary was that decoupled solutions were for content longevity and not for any other real reason. But after seeing what happened on this project, I've sort of come to realize that a decoupled architecture is just a better, more human way to work. Uh, it's really interesting to me that like, we had people who didn't know the site had launched to the public because all they were doing was working on writing APIs and getting those out there. And yes, they were ready middle of January and it made no difference that the public was consuming them first week of February. It just was work that was happening. And we've all been on these crazy projects where content is putting in content the night before and QA is doing all kinds of regression testing and developers are just doing what they can to meet the deadline. Um, and you're putting in, you know, 18 hour days. And that didn't happen in the same way. And, you know, what really happened was that the project launch stresses were decoupled by teams as well. And so, uh, each team had their own sort of mini launch, I could say, you know, at various points in the project, but they weren't dependent on one another. And so it really allowed our team to just sort of focus on getting things done and not focus on what needed to happen. And yeah, I, I now look at these sorts of projects as why should we do this as a full stack? Why not decouple it? Um, I, it's going to take a lot to convince me that I shouldn't do a decoupled website for even my own personal stuff now because it just seems to make sense. Um, and I think by sort of forcing ourselves to work under this really tight timeline, it really inspired everything that we learned out of this. 
And without those constraints, you know, it probably would have ended up being just yet another Drupal site built with views and panels and fields. And it would have been great, but it wouldn't have been what we have today. Um, so that brings us to the end of at least what we wanted to explicitly talk about. Um, for anyone uh, who's been here and just wants to evaluate the session, please go to the schedule and give us your feedback. We would. It would mean a lot. Yeah, it would really touch our hearts. Um, and uh, we'll leave it with some questions. We've got about 15 minutes left according to the schedule. And for anyone who's worked on decoupled sites or just has interesting thoughts, I would love to hear them. Yes, that's former sure. AQ. Hey, guys. Uh, Chris Herring from NBCU ONTS. Hey, nice to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> um, so we do use this as an example internally to um, just highlight you know, how successful a project can be when, when given a deadline. Um, the one thing that's sort of never been clear to me, and you guys didn't really talk about it, so I'm interested to get some inside knowledge on this, really is like, what was the project management process like across all of those different teams and companies? Was there, were you guys aligning iterations? Were you just, each company was doing their own iterations? Was there a scrum of scrums that happened regularly? What was, what was the deal there? Uh, I, yeah, I felt like, um, we haven't talked about this, but uh, yeah, I mean, I felt like uh, there, CBB was uh, running a Scrum type process or an Agile type process with NBC, um, but I felt like the teams operated largely independently, and it still worked. Yeah, be because of this like asynchronous workflow. So you can understand how that may not always happen, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah no, totally. I think the thing. That so, what was the magic is... sauce there? Is what I'm trying to what I'm trying to figure out. There wasn't enough time to have scrum of scrums or, yeah. you know, these sorts of meetings. And because it was such a short timeline, there wasn't the space for the project code and architecture to grow to where it needed that amount of project management. So because we had so many small decoupled systems, yeah. within that small period of time, they could all sort of focus on doing their own thing. And I think the other thing which was really important is that our main discussion points between the teams were not scrums. Yeah, they yeah. were the API right. and the content model. Right. And so by forcing ourselves to discuss like, you know, in those terms, yep. any of the meetings we had were already very focused, whether yeah. it was we need this extra bit of data or oh wait, we gotta think about responsive images or whatever it was. I think that I actually think the loosely um, I just go back to the lip sync, but the loosely competitive structure of having separate teams working on different aspects of it was very useful like uh, because if your failures block other teams and that's a that's a bad feeling it's sort of like you know live up to the moment kind of scrum but uh, th that was effective in, in this project I hear you and I'm yeah. totally impressed I just it definitely takes a leap of faith oh, on yeah. the business side to agree that we're just gonna hope that this works out right I mean, without having is, everything totally planned out I mean ultimately someone was accountable like mm -hmm. yeah CPP was contracted yeah. for it so yeah Okay. They, uh, the teams also weren't totally isolated. Like CPP had someone doing Drupal work. Yep. Um, you know, we did a little bit of work on the front end, just sort of, you know, providing some eyes and some code review and so on. Uh, you know, NBC had internal, like, developers helping out. So, like, yeah. because we had that little bit of cross-pollination, it helped to keep the communication in line. Cool. Definitely Thank you. Visibility. Congrats again, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. So you... Uh, near near the end there, you you talked about why wouldn't you do this for any any project? And and the main thing that I think of is like, you know, in in the traditional Drupal world, we have you know our Drupal site, and 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 we engineer like um, how do how how does the content model work and how do content creators get the stuff in, and then we engineer how that stuff gets displayed on the other side. But now we've got this back end system and this front end system, so we got to basically do the whole process twice, how do we get it in and out of each system? Is it not then twice as much work overall? Even though you're splitting it between multiple teams, mm -hmm. isn't it effectively twice as much hours spent on the project? Um, I don't, I definitely for projects of this scale with this number of developers, I wouldn't say so. Uh, maybe if you're like, you know, a one person shop, uh, it might be a, a harder sell to do. I think the, the real thing to keep in mind is that we actually are rebuilding things in Drupal anyways when you think about it. Like, you've got your content types, which are your fields and so on, and then you're building a view, and that's really just transforming your content into some intermediary format. 
and then you're embedding that with panels or displaying it with CSS and so on. You know, if you replace a lot of those middle steps with writing an API, um, it might be a bit more complicated to think through. But then at the end, you get the ability to do things like totally change your front end without having to worry about breaking the Drupal site, which is something we run into all the time where like someone starts modifying the content model to match whatever it is today, and then you have to spend three weeks updating all the views and panels and custom code to work with it. Okay. I agree. So, so then you, you, you talked about, um, you know, the benefits of de decoupling things means that there, there's fewer dependencies, but then... Uh, are you know early on in the project? Are you with the Drupal out of, pu of putting the, the API? Are you doing you know because things aren't really finalized in Drupal yet? Are you have like a mock output of the API where this endpoint is basically just showing this static file? Yeah, until implementing the API teams gets built? I think ended up doing sort of mocked versions of content com coming out of the system before it was available. So okay. yeah, our initial we actually wrote the API before we implemented it as documentation. And uh, we use this neat tool from Apiary, which basically lets you write in Markdown, and then it includes mar or, uh, syntax for the HTTP requests and responses. And so it gives you really basic stubs for like, you know, an individual guest would be really easy to do. Um, at the time, we ran into trouble with listing queries because then you would end up having to like actually type out 10 responses, you know, 10 items or copy and paste and so on. Um, but some sort of stubbing is, you know, I think really important to, to make this work. Great, thanks. Hey guys, uh, Eric Brown from St. Louis, Missouri. Hi, nice to meet you. I uh, have two quick questions. One, regarding previewing, um, did you guys ever have points where your content creators wanted to like actually preview how uh, the content that they were going to be creating looked in the various client situations. Absolutely, yeah. No, and and almost right away. So uh, that, it's definitely something that uh, you know, like I said, we if we were going to do this again, that would have been an immediate concern. Uh, we did work out a solution where uh, content from uh, Drupal, basically, that was unpublished could could be published and viewed with a, a previewed Node system, a Node.js system. So uh, so they were able to do that eventually, um, and absolutely they wanted that right away. And anybody who ever does this will want that. So don't ever like leave it to the last moment, basically. Absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. And then uh, second question, technically, uh, I noticed that when you showed like the response from the uh, the API, there wasn't much Drupalism in the data. So can you talk about what work you did to kind of strip out the Drupal, you know, all the, the hierarchy of data? Yeah. So like because, so we use services, but then we have a module called Publisher API. It actually started out as NBC API and then we made it generic so we could steal it for tonight's show and it worked out well that way. Um, but we weren't using views or anything, which meant that we weren't getting default fields, like we weren't undoing what Drupal was giving us, we were opting into what we wanted to send out. And one of our, our design decisions early on when we were designing the API was exactly what we were talking about. We didn't want to think about Drupalisms mm -hmm. because that made it easy for us as the Drupal architects to be lazy. Um, we didn't want our, like if, if you're encoding Drupalisms into the API, then you're assuming that the consumers of that API understand Drupal and that's just not cool. So. Um, we really sort of ended up with a system where, you know, the most Drupal in the API code is really entity field query and database queries, and there's a little bit, we've got some caching in place at the uh, sort of object response level, mm -hmm. um, but everything else from that is just like, get the data you need, make it match the docs, please. Yeah, most of the the mechanics of it rely on um, an abstraction on top of dbtng, uh, and and also yeah the caching layer um, and EFQ sometimes to assemble lists. Yeah. And is the API like is that publicly available or is that strictly locked down to the client? It is not. not. No, it's not yet. Okay, um, so you don't have to. Yeah, deal with that. I, it's something we've been meaning to talk about. Okay. Thanks, guys. Sure. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, ah, uh, Matt. <laughs> hey guys, I know I worked on the project. I'm not trying to be a troll. Um, Our man on video, please yes. give a round of applause for this guy. Sure, no, no, no. These guys do the work. <laughs> um, I, I do have a question though, because um, I was pretty isolated from a lot of the implementation. When you hear about uh, these decoupled projects, 
the fighting words that usually start are, well, what about SEO when you have these magical JavaScript <laughs> front ends that render your content? Yes. How was that handled? Can you guys speak to that at all? And we're out of time, it looks like. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, again, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying Actually, not to be like, it was handled. What, that's why Node existed. Cool. So anything that was static HTML was coming out from Node. Mm -hmm. And so, mo like, I don't know the stats, but, it, like, well, I don't know the act, the current stats, but it used to be something ridiculous. Like 99% of the traffic was backbone hitting the API directly. Um, and then, you know, basically Google just crawls the site through the node system. And the neat thing is, I don't know if they actually did this, but I know we talked about, like the reason they used node was so they could reuse some of the backbone code for displaying the site. So it would actually be the same. I think they did it that way. I think way. that's true. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. like cool. you it said, we had like good. so visi little visibility to the to the node side. It was interesting, but yeah, but yeah I think they did. Um, we did like have like routing and URLs becomes really difficult. I think with a lot like if you're not thinking about that on your app side, and it was kind of refreshing to not even have to think about path auto or anything like that on the Drupal side. But it's still difficult, or still a problem that needs to be solved. We just got to say, you know, hey, Crispin Porter, you get to do this. Awesome. Thanks. Anything else? Thank you very much, guys. Right. Thank you very much. Good night, Austin, Texas, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs>